Hey, we're live again at Crawdaddy's, folks, with Michael Koss. <laughs> Listen, uh, you know, Mike and I did a video a couple weeks ago, and oh my God, my phone was ringing off the hook with, oh, ask Mike this, ask Mike that. So I might be putting you on the spot a little bit here. I'm ready. Are you? You know what everybody wants to know about? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of questions. Well, yeah. since we've been rooming the last few days, yeah. I already kind of, yeah. I've been so, prompted. You know, yeah, so, so many questions. So this is yo, give it out that we we did you rehearse talk this about a little bit. Dick Dasherly. You know, yeah. <laughs> so everybody about. wants to know about you playing with Pete Rose. Oh yeah, him. Yeah, that's what I meant. So uh, you remember? Uh, uh, I don't know. About ten years ago, you brought Johnny Bench here, uh -huh. and everybody started asking about Pete Rose and Johnny immediately. Said, I don't want to talk about. It. Yeah, because he talked about it, you know, a thousand times. Is and, that why? Mm hmm. But everybody wants and to things, know your opinion on the opinions and facts changed over the time. <laughs> okay, so. so your opinion should Pete Rose be in the Hall of Fame? Nope. And the reason you say is, well, uh, I I could explain it in a little bit of a paragraph. You know, it's, <clears throat> it is worthy of such. I'm going to give you some extra time on this. Okay, so here's the way I look at it. Number one, when he walks into his office. There is a sign the size of that picture right there that says, if you gamble, you will be banned for life. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the facts of the matter are more than people understand, and you have to read the Dowd report. Right, which I read. It. Yeah, okay, and that, if you can't figure it out by reading that, then you should, you're dumb. Okay. So the bottom. <laughs> you're calling a whole lot of people dumb. They're dumb. They're right. ignorant because they don't, you're ignorant if you don't. Dig up the facts. Rules are for everybody. Oh, and yeah. You got to follow. No, right? this crossed the line. Picture this. Okay, so he's in uniform. He leaves the dugout. Now, I'm going to describe the actual, the top things. So he leaves the dugout in uniform to make bets. And people say, oh, well, he didn't bet on the Reds. Well, it doesn't matter. At that time, there was 24 teams. That means there's 12 games per day on a full day, and he's in there betting on seven to 10 games per day, thousands of dollars. And so you'll know this, our cameraman understand this because he's been a criminal part of his life. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm gonna compete with Bob the next time he comes for sure. But anyway, he cross the line man i mean big time if you're gambling and you're wagering these amounts of money if you don't pay guess who knocks on the door uncle guido yeah right and yeah. they there it's so basically that's too close to the integrity of the game and he crossed the line in the Dowd, and, and the Dowd report though did he Dowd even said himself that he he's pretty sure that he bet no the the amounts and the, the games were listed in there yeah the so he got are in there. Three thousand on the Phillies, Cubs. Four thousand on the Dodgers, Giants. Two grand on the you know Expos, whatever. He had those bets there, there in writing. And here's the other part: the tragedy of the whole thing. He could have gotten out of it. He could have been in the Hall of Fame. But he's such. Sorry about this, folks. He's such an egotistical, narcissistic maniac that he wouldn't. He wouldn't say I'm sorry. He wouldn't succumb to the the right thing to do and go in there immediately and admit no. guilt and say I'll do whatever has to be no. done uh, for Major League Baseball. Was that Bud Selig? At the Every time? commissioner that comes in, he's in there begging. I remember when that you know, happened, and he wouldn't. So that's, he wouldn't apologize. That's my opinion. I'm, I'll never change. I, 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 so let me tell you, if he hears this. And I don't know if he was going to do it before, but I'm pretty sure you're not going to get a Christmas card from them after this interview. Oh, you think? Oh, man. Yeah. Well, well. No, anyway. we need one. Yeah, we quit doing those anyway, so yeah. take that. Anyway, well, <laughs> I've I got to tell you, though. Have you ever been to the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown? I, I have not. I have. In fact, I was coming out of Cooperstown, and, oh, my God, there was Willie Mays. It was 105 degrees, and he was in a sweater. I thought that was odd. But anyway... Uh, if you go to the Hall of Fame, there's a museum up front, and Pete Rose is <laughs> everywhere in that museum. Not in the in the the actual the where lobby, all the, the statues in the, the lobby. lobby. Yeah, right. the museum is in the back where all those statues are, and yeah. he's not in that. Which I didn't even give a shit. I didn't even want to go. I went in there; it was boring. A bunch of statues. 
I loved all the, uh, the you know, the, like the stuff you gave me, all the uh, memorabilia and all the records that have been kept over Hall Major of Fame. League. Just another kind of a debacle, and I don't I I say so anything too. about my buddies and, and guys I played against that are in there. Of course, you know they almost all of them deserve to be there, but they've made such a Gaskell of the thing. There's yeah, I don't think it's what it used to. be. Hundreds of guys who should be in there right now, and they're just. Do you think? Do you think Barry Bonds should be in there? Oh sure, I do too. Clemens, why is Clemens? Why is Clemens there? not in there? McGuire, all of them. Sosa is Sosa in that? Was in he, there? Yeah, no. Was he, no. Was he busted for any drugs? You know, Eddie. Right? No, no. He well, should they, be in there. Why is uh, why is why is Barry Bonds? There's other guys too that I can mention, and I, you. We could cause some real stuff here. I could mention some stuff, but I yeah. won't. But I'm just saying. Uh, and you have 500 of these ridiculous, they're not even sports writers anymore. That was done in the early days because there's no planes. The, the writers rode with the players on the trains. These guys don't go to the games. They don't know anything. And they, they're ruining the Hall of Fame. They're ruining it. Well, I have know. retired ball players do it instead of sports. That's players. my opinion. It should be the a committee of retired players, well, that, players, that scouts, and general managers, people that know the game. Hell, the, the news media has changed anyway. Who's the press anymore? No, oh, just say, but they've ruined it with these clowns on this, even the MLB network, clown show, complete clown show. I said that. And I mean it. Joe Jackson. Watched it from day one turn into a clown show. Well. Anyway, anyway, that's anyway. enough of Pete Rose. You only played with him that one season. I, I spring didn't training a couple of years, and then uh, in '78 he was a third, and uh, cost me a game in Chicago, <laughs> one nothing shutout going into the ninth. Anyway, uh, yeah, and then he and Sparky were shipped down the river. 1979, John McNamara came in, and Ray Knight went to third base. Oh, yeah, I I, I remember all. You played with so many amazing players. I did. I mean, especially that first Reds team. Just lucky. Uh, I mean, my God, that was who's who in baseball in, in the late seventies, early eighties. Well, there's those guys that you see, but there's another twice as many guys. That, that, how are you going to break in as a catcher with bench as a catcher ahead of you? Yeah. How are you going to break into? Hey, I'm speaking are you of gonna catchers, Davy out at shortstop. I don't think so. That was so Speaks, uh, Speaking of catchers, one time Mike took me to the game up in. Uh, so, uh, San Francisco, and I got to meet the catcher, the manager Bruce Bucci. How did did you? What team were you on? With, were played, you ever I on? I played against him, but you were just friends. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, he's a nice guy. That guy. There's a bunch of us that were California. Oh, I, I didn't know we you played never, golf terms. I thought you might have been on the uh, Astros with him. No. He was in the Astros organization, but I've a couple <laughs> years ahead of him. Oh, okay. Well, you told me another story the other day that I had to laugh. Now, and this is funny. So you're bouncing around, and you come to the Giants, which my favorite subject is my plan on the Giants. And uh, that story you told me about spring training the other day when you're throwing batting practice. Oh, the, so, Will, the uh, Will Clark? Yeah, yeah tell, him, <laughs> tell him the story. You didn't even know who Will Clark was at the time. I did not. So I, you know, I had uh, just – Talked to Al Rosen, got an invitation to spring training, and I have no clue who's on the team. I know Kruko and the, the older guys, Minton and some of Lasky, you know, leftover guys. But basically, I just come roaring into spring training, and I'm trying to get a job. Yeah, and I'm close to midseason form. So after a day or two, uh, you know, in batting practice, the usually the veteran style of BP is you throw, say they got 15 cuts, so you throw five or six, seven right down the middle. To and just BP speed, and then you try to work a couple corners, and then after a week or two, here come the breaking balls and the stuff, okay? Right. Well, this is like the second or third time, and I'm going to try to, you know, he took his normal swings. So here's Will Clark. He's taking BP off me. Well, you don't know who Will Clark is. I have is, no so clue who he is. I don't know he's the number one pick and all this stuff. Well, a couple in here, and then one sales, and so he's got this close stance, as you know, with his elbow here, and I hit him in the elbow. And the, you're still trying to make the team. Yeah. And then you just hit the potential well, franchise first, in the album. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> so now, you know, the entire emergency ward comes from the hospital. <laughs> yeah, $10 million. Fire trucks show with. up. All the trainers are out there. And I'm done. I'm out in center field. And I'm going, holy shit, man. I said, so I go over by Crook and Brentley going, 
the hell's going on, man? He's like, see, the guy die or something? And they go, oh, no. the cook's making fun of me now. He goes, ah, you hit the number one pick. He'll have it. And I'm like, oh, no. Yeah, good right. luck on that contract. So I yeah. stood back there behind the two of them in case they were looking for me. I don't want to talk to anybody. So that it went over good, you know. But uh, And he forgave me for it, too. You guys became pretty good friends because I met him with yeah, you. you he, I could tell he liked you. He's hor horrible. Besides the compound, having my carte blanche gold card uh, get in free, I have a, one of those at his ranch. Oh, that's Double cool. Double deuce uh, ranch in, in Stark. I won't say where it is. It's in Mississippi. Oh, my God. He is from the hills of Mississippi. That guy, when I heard him talk, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it, man. He's, he's a hillbilly. No, he's a swamp rat. Yeah, whatever. He's something else. He's quite a character. Uh, hey, uh, anyway, obviously most of you know Will Clark went on to be Mr. San Francisco Giant for quite a few years. But uh, I want you to tell, this might be a little harder to tell, but the story of Goose Gossage as your teammate on the Giants is one that I never stopped You want the about. one, the airplane episode? Yeah, yeah, give me the airplane episode. <laughs> I can't, just loves this. I can't, I love I can't believe it. Well, um, Goose was quite a, the drinker, right? And, that, and you're not a drinker, so that gets on your nerves. Not real. I mean, I'll have, at the time, you know, because of the Will Clark wedding incident. Yes, I'm not really drinking, you know. I, but anyways, right out of the shoot, you know, he comes to the ball club, and a couple of nights he comes to me, you know, he says, "Hey, we're you know, working on this." Um, I said, "Go to TGI Fridays down there on El Camino Real." He's in San Mateo, where I am, you know. So he goes, well, I don't have one of those. Like, okay. So I go over there. And so that night, you know, he threw down 12 or 13 beers. I had like two. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, this guy. So now here we go. We're on a fast forward. We're on a road trip. And he's already pitched a little bit, you know, and he's at the end. I mean, come on. And uh, he's in his late 30s by now. Yeah, I, you'd have to look that up. All I know is what I know, you know. And, so I have my seat on the plane, seniority. It's the uh, stretch 27 exit area by the gallery, the galley. So I've got 10 feet of leg room. <laughs> you know, and he, finally he came back and he goes, can, can I sit over here tonight? You know, I'm like, yeah, sure. So he sits in there and I've got my headphones on. About, <laughs> about an hour or two. <laughs> so here we are. And Got up, you know, it's about a four-hour flight. Don't remember where we're going. And so he's probably polished off a few cocktails, I would imagine, by now. So I get up, you know, and oh, I get, and he's sitting over there. And at some point, man, he just looks over and he goes, hey. he's had quite a few, hey, Mike. Go, yeah. yeah. He goes, am I that fucking bad? <laughs> and I go, yep. I can just see you doing that. <laughs> I go, yeah. I so, said, the hitters will let you know, big boy. <laughs> yeah. That's funny because that guy was always my hero. Uh, and the, no, you know them on a personal level is funny. But the funniest one, in my opinion, was me going from San Francisco to Chicago. And it's an off day, and we polished off a few. 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So off we go. And we get... You know, here we come. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. We noticed, holy shit, he's like shit faced, you know. 10 in the morning? Oh, it's no, now it's like, it's, off, it's like time. five. No, it's off day. It's like five oh, o'clock. Okay. It's five o'clock now. So we get on the old city bus. We get two buses and on we go. And so, <laughs> I'll never forget because it's great when your teammates get it, you know, they just get it. So I'm sitting next to Bedrosian like this. Everybody, that would be Steve Bedrosian. He was a pitcher. So for, he, for the Giants. Well, they made the trade to come because I was closing at the time and didn't want to do it. So they made the trade. And now he's, yeah. so we're, he's been on the team now for a while. And look who's sitting next to us. By, a seat all by himself. There he, he is. There he is. Oh, they were both closers. Huh? Oh, but he's hardly pitching now. He's, he's about done. So oh, he, no. now check this out. This is really funny. So he's sitting there and he's an off day. He's not shaved. He's yeah. got the going here you know it's all gnarly yeah and he's sideways <laughs> and so i look over and i i look at bedrock and, and i go hey look at this and he looks over and i go 
the freaking cowardly lion. Come on, <laughs> put him up. And he saw that and he went off on <laughs> He didn't like that, huh? No, he, he never woke up. Oh, God. and we were all making fun of him over the top of him. He never got up. And we laughed and laughed about that. And he looked just like him. You know, the, I, he he oh, would look like the Oh, he looked just guy. like the cowardly is, lion. You know, is he still around? You know, I hope he doesn't see this interview. I don't care. Go on. You don't scare, <laughs> you don't scare me. <laughs> Anyway, the intimidation factor is over. Buddy. Yeah, that was back on the Yankees anyway, huh? Oh, well, yeah, when all this big Thurman Munson and you got yeah. Winfield, these guys would stick up for him. I think it was after Thurman, but... I got to wait for Will Clark to come to my yeah, rescue yeah. from first base. Yeah. Hey, but, uh, of all the people that you played with, uh, who'd, you, who'd you admire and like the most? Hard to tell. <laughs> you played with or was it Yeah, that you played with. Oh, man. That's really funny. Yeah. So, Johnny B was a hell of a guy. Though, I mean, I mean, we're still, I just, just yeah. texted him the other day. I know. He's got I, health I, issues. I, I remember he, yeah, uh, we're, we're pretty close. he you called you. We were up hanging out on the second floor, and he called you the other day. And, uh, you know, I've just played with so many. And yeah. the problem is now, sir, is a lot of them are gone. Yeah. Okay, yeah. those guys that you're referring to? So yeah. It's, it's a lot of them are gone. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, nice. I played. We lost a couple. Uh, one big guy that we went to high school with this year. Isn't that something? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I played with all these guys with the Reds, and, and the minor league guys were, you know, were really tight. Uh, Steve Henderson, Danny Norman, Joel Youngblood. These guys. These are all Perry Spillman, Ronnie Oster, all of it. Mike Grace. We all played minor league years and years together. You know, we're all at the same level. Harry Spillman and I played on three major league teams, different teams together. That's unbelievable. Wow. And, yeah. And so, I you know, I asked yeah, those, you, you, you were on four different teams? Huh? Four different teams? We played on every minor league team and three major league oh, teams together. That's cool. Harry and I. Wow. And then I played, you know, with Nolan and Art Howe and... and uh, oh, you were with <laughs> Nolan Ryan on, three, on the Astros? Three years. Alan Ashby, Cheo Cruz. Man, I looked, I looked guys, up man. on that roster on the Houston Astros. That was quite a pitching staff. Yeah. Wasn't Don Sutton on that, too? You don't know how I got there? How'd you get there? Real quick? Yeah. Spring training, 1982. Four days left. And I get the old... <laughs> from the outfield. From, from Oh, you're Mark. on the Reds. Yeah, I'm in the outfield shagging, and when the when the clubhouse manager comes out and <laughs> goes like this, it's a bad news. You know, you got the. I think you're usually told bad the news. Story, Grandpa, but I like hearing it. So. Oh, I did he? On yeah. the last one? Yeah. Did I, Eddie? Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure no, that I got, you got the boot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and so, so it's a great yeah, story. But, but it's still a good story. Good you got story, the boot yeah. from the Reds and ended up at the last minute on the Astros. I joined the Astros on opening day as their tenth man. On opening just day. Opening day. I walked in there. They had a uni ready, and I threw my bags down and put that uni on. You, know, you played, what, three years there? <laughs> yeah. Did you like Houston? I did, and I liked it. God, when I went there, it was so humid. I thought, oh, I hate this But, I mean, place, the, you know, the Astrodome is tough. I don't care what they say. Yeah, the, the, the dimensions were a little large, yeah. but, man, it's tough to pitch in there. My guys were really able to hit the ball hard. Then. No, with the turf. I'm a sinker ball pitcher, man. And the turf, oh, everything yeah. gets through, man. Everything bounces over everything the short gets pad or something. Yeah. But, the, but uh, uh, an incident occurred that turned my career around in there. One day, this is where the guns and the speeds becoming a factor. We got Dr. Gene Coleman behind the home plate. And just talking around the batting cage when he goes, he says, you know, your slider is only about three miles an hour off your, your sinker. I said, really? It didn't make sense because I used to own guys like Schmidt. I owned him for five years. He's talking about Mike Schmidt. Mike Schmidt. Who hit over Hall 50. Of fame, Hall of Fame, third base. He hit home. over 50 home runs, I think, more than once. So so Hall of Fame, quite third hitter. base. Yeah. The Phillies. Okay. And I used to own him. And then all of a sudden, you know, Second year, I'm in the dome, you know, this big, and all of a sudden, I right center. Next time up, center. He's hit two home runs off me in one game. I'm going, okay. I'm kind of stubborn like you, making changes. I'm not stubborn. <laughs> so I got to I gotta change my stuff, seriously. And I, I got to me that day, and I thought, well, I better do something. And because, you know, big league hitters, I don't care how good it is. Yeah. Eventually, they're going to get hit. 
So that changed me. And then I, so I, I'm out in the outfield with Don Sutton in Philadelphia. And I said, all right. Because, <laughs> you know, he's got the finger up. Um, you can see it. I watched, Don? Yeah, I watched him throw beat bullpens and stuff. But I wanted to know what was going, what was happening. Why is he doing this? And what it is, is it's a bio uh, physical thing. If you turn your finger up, you actually can't throw the ball and get rid of it straight. It automatically turns your... Without turn up your elbow, turns, right? No, it just turns your wrist for you, and, the, and then you can oh. push a little bit. And he's, that's why he had a great breaking ball. He showed it to me. I threw it like three or four times in the outfield, and I had it. Oh, wow. So that year I started. And then the next year, I started sitting around, separating my fingers, working on that. Pretty soon I was comfortable with it. That, that's what they call the split finger split finger. Faster. Once I added those two pitchers, pitches, I was a different When you pitcher. put that ball in there like that and you throw it, and I turned did my you finger still down. get the velocity? Oh, no. <laughs> it was, it's like a changeup, isn't it? It's a changeup. So but the harder is a change. But the harder you throw it, the better it is. I mean, it's sailing. No, it sinks. It well, whatever, just, it's not going straight. It looks just like my sinker. Looks just like my sinker. Okay. But did you throw a number two straight curveball a lot? I got this. That's well, my curveball. That was your curveball? Yes. You, so you didn't wrench your arm like the little kids in Little League do, huh? No, you wait till the last second. It's a fastball, it's a fastball, and right out here. It automatically starts turning your wrist for you. All you do is you turn your wrist, the ball comes over the top, and you pull right on down, right down through it to get so, 12, 6. So over year after you year. You see that? Come yeah, flying out. That out buddy. Thank you. So anyway, uh, so this, what the kids do, You what, when I coach kids in Little League, I said, man, oh, it's the same. Quit it's, throwing that curveball where they just do oh, this. Oh, that's yeah, bad, that's, man. That's not right. But this even, curveball was a water problem. But even with the fingers together, you still have to do the same thing. And when you think about it, the last thing that the ball is touching is your middle finger. Your index finger is not really doing anything. Right. It kind of gets out of the way. The ball comes over the top of those. And then how about this is why your arm, you do this and then your arm pronates. And that's bad right there. Every pitch okay. you throw, your, your arm pronates at some point. I like that word. I've never heard that word. Pronates. I'm actually very, I'm hanging out with a very educated oh, I'm man. I'm very, here. very versed in stuff. Uh, <laughs> ACL uh, tear, PCL tear, chips. Uh, uh, yeah, you got paid you know. for those tears. Quit whining. I, I did something nobody's ever done. Pitch seven years with a torn ACL. No one's ever done that. <laughs> Tough guy, Mike Cos. And two to two ten inning complete games in there. Hey, you know I read a, uh, you know, because I I got no life. I sit around and read ignorance on the internet. <laughs> You're the last guy to throw a ten inning shutout for the Giants. No, one nothing against the Dodgers. You know, nice. it's hanging up on the wall up there. Pal. Right, I gave nice. it. I, gave I know you gave it to Prada, yeah, so and we're right very there. proud to mount it on the wall. But I thought, you know, what that must have been, 1986. I mean, that's been over 30 years, and you're still the last guy to throw ten complete innings. That's just something they just don't do. Anymore. They won't do it unless they change their yeah. attitude about. It. Things. I mean, the, the hundred pitch mark. They're looking to get out of there, get them out of there. Those that ten inning game, I may have only thrown a hundred pitches, maybe ninety four. You're getting a lot of ground balls and getting out of. Come on, dude! Out. You're having a, you're gonna have a rough day. I just have a, you know, I'm a human. I don't know. We're on. Yeah. Uh, Nolan Ryan's just on more than I am. Yeah. He's got a yeah. you know gift of this. Yeah, but Ryan, the Ryan arm. expressed through a lot of pitches because he was striking so many. Well, no, I'm just saying. I mean, whatever you got. Uh, if you're a big league pitcher, you should have days where you're on and you can go out and control the game. That's kind of like me. It's on just my how guitar. many days? How many days can you do that? Yeah. It, you know, you get then you get an injury and then you get another thing and now the battle's on. What's the yes, closest sir. to a no hitter you ever came? <laughs> I start a game in uh, in Candlestick. Eddie asked about how close it came to throwing a no hitter. It's like one to nothing games are incredible. Yeah. So I start a game in Candlestick against the X. Of course, now the Nationals. First, first hitter out. Second hitter out. Next hitter, <laughs> typical Lacoste first inning. Two outs. Walk the next hitter. Next hitter, a bloop. Next hitter, Tim Wallach, a three-run homer. That's how I opened the game. After that, I retired every hitter after the rest oh, of the game. Oh man! And That's Al, and Al Rosen run. came in, and I didn't know. I didn't even know I did it. And Al and, and Bob Lurie. Bob is a great guy. They came down into the clubhouse. 
And I'm like, hey, man, that was unreal. I'm like, yeah, I beat him four to three. Oh, wow. So I won the game four to three, and I was happy about that because I was so pissed. I, I had I had these first inning blues occasionally, and, man, it's just – it's on your – it's in your dome, you know, and you, I'm like, yeah, I got two outs, and then, yeah. I, then I walk the next time. I'm like – Isn't that horrible? Ugh. Guy's really dealing, and he's just throwing a great game, going to throw a no-hitter, and he gives up some bullshit – Texas oh, leaguer, uh, or I led the league in bloop and broken bat hits for uh, sure. I also led the league in double play balls. Well, yes. look it up. Really? Oh, well, we can find this out in the in the top in the top tiers of both leagues. And when I'm and I have my full years of leading in double play balls. That's a testament to your sinker ball, right? Right. I, I just believe, I know all this it. baseball language. Got me to the big leagues because I didn't throw ninety five or ninety six miles an hour, so it got me there, and it kept me there for a long time. You didn't. What, what did you throw in ninety? Ninety. Really? I could hump up to ninety four, but you can't pitch at ninety four. You can't just stay so there. I got to throw one at ninety two. Show it to him. Come back to ninety. Maybe take a little off. Eighty seven, uh, eighty six. Zip. Isn't it amazing? For all those years, the Ryan Express was dealing in the high nineties. Oh, he's unbelievable. He's by far, he's by far. I no don't arm ever existed like that. Nobody is ever going to do anything like that. I say that because, the, I mean, somebody could do it, but the odds of somebody achieving yeah, that. Yeah, never say never, but, but I'm even telling Clem, you, Clemens did. Remember all the that. pitchers I, I told you about one last night? Juan Berenguer, when he signed with the Mets, throwing 106 miles an hour, except it was 15 feet high on the backstop. So that has a, there's a little problem there. Yeah. The loose. <laughs> Just a little problem. Yeah. But Nolan was, I mean, once he got his control, I mean, unbelievable. How many no nos did he Seven. Seven. Seven no, no hitters. Gonna, do that. Seven no hitters. That's just un unbelievable. I watched, I watched him do and stuff. And he threw a no no at 40, right? I saw J.R. Richard Sieber, Carl. Now, Steve Carlton was unbelievable, but not as good as Tom, uh, as uh, Noah. Hey, Lake you know Lake. you know who had a streak? Was uh, Oral Hirsch? Ner Heiser. Needle nose. Yeah, is that what you call it? <laughs> Did you, you, you got to see him up We're close. friends. Yeah, We're friends. Around. Well, he. I don't remember Eddie when he was. He threw like fifty straight innings of uh, fifty-eight something. He surpassed Rysdale. Fifty-six. That's right. That's what it was. Of, 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 of no runs, scoreless fifty scoreless so, innings. Man, that that's he. He was on fire at that time. Sinker, sink, and a breaking ball. Because you get sinkers, you get so many ground he balls. Had a nasty right? you one. Could not get. I mean, the key, no, the key to it, the key to it is what people don't realize. It's late when it starts moving. You, right. You can't, you can't. You don't see it. People and then go, all how, of a sudden how did he jam that guy? It's only 91 miles an hour. It's because it's late. Not everybody, it's, that's the most toughest thing to develop or have. You don't know when your pitches are going to start moving in that distance. So Honestly, I don't know how anybody <laughs> hits, hits big league pitchers. They're throwing the ball so hard, and it's moving all over the place. I remember in high school, uh, I, I Mike threw batting practice to me over at COS, and I took about three cut. I, I stood in there for about three pitches. And this eight-foot gorilla is out there, half side arm, and I thought, oh, my God, the ball's coming from behind my back. I'll, hit, I'll wait, man. I'll wait till he gets off that I am both My most embarrassing at bat is my first. I'm in Chicago, and of course the fans are right here, and they're all over me. Some guys behind me threatening to kill me. I'm on the on deck circle, oh, getting ready to go hit. The guy's threatening to kill me. He's what right were you mouthing off? That made no, I'm on the, no, I'm pitching. I'm, oh. I'm talking to the guy. I'm on the circle, but it's right here, yeah. Wrigley Field. Yeah. The guy's he's gonna kill me after the game or something like that. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> and Big Daddy Rick Russell is on the mound. You know, and this guy first of you all, you really liked him, huh? Oh, where he's a, yeah, another great good friend of mine. Now. The thing about Big Daddy is, I think you look at him, you go, "This guy's not even an athlete." Like Seems like a teddy bear. Really. He's the size of both of those doors, oh, yeah, sure. and he's extremely athletic. So I'm, I'm here. I am. I'm all cocky. I'm a, yeah. It's my first year. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rip one off this big old fat pig up there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I know. So I, I go and now, but this guy's on me now, and he's, he's like, he's gonna kill me. So I go up there. This is my most embarrassing at bat ever. No, I have two. I go up there and he throws me a pretty good hard sinker on right on the black on the corner. Back door, boom, strike one. I'm like, 
should. <laughs> so I, and then he throws me a curveball that, like you said, the looked, big hook. No, that looked like a, from the body. Yeah. I'm not kidding you. I, I thought it was like five feet behind me. I didn't know which way to go, and I'm like, whoa, like that, and then whoop, strike two. <laughs> I don't feel sorry for you because I, when I got up in, in front of you, I, that's how I felt every time you threw. Us. And then what's he do? He throws one like coming at me. I'm going, oh, I got this. I swung it. It was like five feet outside. <laughs> See you later. And then the other worst one was Bill Negro in Atlanta. Damn, He's got two yeah, strikes on me, and Benedict is catching you. He's, and he throws me a knuckleball. I swung at it, and it hit the backstop over there. It was like 12 feet it's outside. A wild pitch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Phil Unbelievable. Oh, uh, it was, he passed away, right? Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. were both friends of mine. I played with Joe, and he's a good, great guy, good friend of mine. They were both about the same age, weren't they? They were like, you know. They were both in the bigs at the but same see, time. Joe, but see, another one, he passed away early, 60s. Oh, really? Phil made it to the 80s. Both are no hitters. Mm -hmm. Both Necros threw no hitters? Actually, Joe should have had a much better stats and career. And this is the reason why, folks. His knuckleball was so good and hard, they couldn't catch it. He'd get in trouble because they'd swing strike catch three, hit him the backstop or a wild pitch. He's constantly got guys going and they can't catch it. So That's he'd have to crazy. try to throw in a little slider and a little fastball. Wow. But his knuckleball was uncatchable for sure. What was the old Dodger that was the knuckleball and the old guy? Marshall? Charlie Huff. Charlie Huff. That's why you have me here today. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to say something about Roger Clemens. And I'm going to clear the air on this. Yeah, okay. That's good. I want to hear that. Yeah, I want to clear the air. Everybody, or not everybody, but the lunatics in the, out there are trying to say that this guy, the reason he did this, this, because he was on steroids. No, that's not the reason that he I heard did he what he hard did. Work. Two reasons. Two reasons. Sweet peas. Okay, why? Number one. Sweet peas. He comes up with a pitch uh -huh. right there. In the dirt, swung on and missed, strike three. And that turned his whole pitching repertoire around. And then the second reason is expansion there were another four more teams right yeah so now there's a now there is about a hundred and something pitchers in the big leagues that should have been in triple-a and there's players that shouldn't be in the big leagues. right they're mona so so these guys look at the pitches that these guys hit for home runs i mean come on and clemens you know what i, I gotta I, I, I gotta tell you i never thought about that all of a sudden, those guys Diluted. are 60 home runs because the pitcher won this ball. Diluted talent pool. Do you think the ball was harder? Yes, they messed with the ball all the time, though. And the, they, the ball was harder, and the pitching wasn't as they tough. They messed with the ball all the time. The ballparks are a joke. The bike, I don't care when you played. i seen George Foster and Bench and Stargell hit, and Schmidt hit balls completely out of the stadiums. I, I seen Stargell hit a ball in the parking lot. I saw. I was at Dodger Stadium. Completely in the yeah, parking lot. Stargell hit it completely out of the ballpark. Hey, we go to wow. we go to Japan. We're playing a high school field. Oh man, ballpark. 290, them, huh? 290, 3, 310, and three sixty five. Well, Yankee Stadium to right field. Out, out of the ballpark. Completely out of the stadiums. <laughs> <laughs> Yankee Stadium on the right field corner was two eighty. Two ninety nine or something like oh, that. Oh, two eighty. Well, we got yeah. the internet. Something like that. No, but I, my point is the fences are a joke. I don't care. And once they came up with the hard, the hard ball, yeah. it's a joke, man. I seen balls hit so hard you can't even believe it. Okay, so, so listen. Anyway, I cleared air on Roger Clemens. Well, Roger Clemens was a hell of a pitcher. Yeah, That's you don't what, you don't no win three hundred and fifty games in the big leagues, and he won three hundred and fifty games. He's automatic Hall of Fame. He should be. Look, at, they kept Tommy John out. They kept uh, Burt Blylevin out. Uh, Jim Cott. They have all these weird. And how could you not be unanimous if you're Johnny Bench? How could you not be unanimous if you're Greg Maddox? How could you not? One guy. That's why I, you know, besides he wants some publicity. That's why I don't like the way the Hall of Fame is. Going. No, you're right. That's all screwed up. Hey, you know we're almost done here, but I I gotta ask you about my my all-time hero and i knew you got to hang around with him see you guys uh was the great willie mays oh yeah. 
You, you, what a what a what a privilege. Yeah. Uh, was that cool to get to just hang around and talk to him? Yep. I was and he was nice to you, right? He's a nice. Oh, guy. We're, no, we're like buddies. I was just uh, actually I drove for him for a couple. Of no weeks. kidding. Yeah, because uh, he's had to take the Mercedes to the shop, so we had to order parts. He's like, Hey, should you take me to the auto parts store? I'm, <laughs> Sure, I said I, no, I, I can't even imagine you know Willie Mays going to the hey. auto parts. Well, as the automotive, I said yeah, but I said I got this fast car out there. It's a Taurus SHO. He goes, what's that? I go, oh, you'll be all right. I got seat belts. So I, said, I ended up taking him around for a couple of weeks in that thing. But dude, he you know that, me, that Taurus SHO yes. super high out is what that sound. Those Correct. things blew. I, said, I got you give him one, a ride. You show him what that thing was capable of doing. Oh, I scared him. Oh, that's funny. I also uh, took care of Kevin Mitchell one night in his brand new BMW. I said, "You come into the clubhouse next morning." I said, "How much did you pay for that Beamer? Forty-five grand?" He said, "The Taurus was twenty. But he, he had a little problem. Anyway, so you guys like idiots went out and raced or something? right down Scottsdale yeah. Boulevard. Yeah, good job. That was that was brilliant. I'm glad you didn't get hurt. Ruined. Your it was career. only uh, a couple hundred. <clears throat> but Mays was great, huh? And uh, I got to know him real well, and uh, he. Uh, you know, of course, he came in the clubhouse uh, during the season. He hung out in spring training. Did he live in the he, Bay Area? Yeah, he lives in. Where's he living now? I mean, he's got to be on his. He lives in Atherton. Atherton. Where's the, I don't know where that. Where's Atherton? South Bay. Bay. Oh, South, South Bay. So does does he ever come to the games anymore? Can't now. He's in. He's uh, really he's, old. I think he's. I think he's bedridden. He's blind, and he's got, oh, he's man. got some health. He's he's not doing well. So Boston. those old giants are gone, man. McCovey passed away, what, two years ago? Yeah. yeah. Cepeda's still Eddie's, alive, though. Eddie, yeah, I talked to him. Yeah, yeah, I talked to him. You were talking about getting Orlando Cepeda to come hang out with us here at Crawford. Yeah. That'd be cool, huh, Eddie? Eddie was great. Hello. He goes, hello. With Aaron. I go, Orlando, who is this? That's Mike. <laughs> Mike. You mean Mike. he's still got a heavy accent? Uh, yeah, I, Mike Lacoste. Hey, oh, yeah, Mike Lacoste, how you doing, man? Hey, <laughs> how you doing? We good, need- Orlando. How you doing, buddy? Oh, you're doing good, man. I got a home over here. They take care of good guy. Take good well, tell him to come to Crawdaddy's. We'll take good care of him. So, what do you want, Eddie? Willie Mays said that if steroids cause you to hit home runs, then all of you would be playing. Exactly. It's a, it's a level playing field. If I, those guys go out there and play drunk, I don't know if you drunk. heard what Eddie just said, but it's very true. You could go. That May said if steroids <laughs> cause you to hit home runs, everybody would be playing. You know? Exactly. I don't think Vaughn's. Bonds might have hit it a few more feet with the strength and everything, but he could hit what way back. Well, let me tell you something. I played golf with him one day. In his, in the right when he first came to the Giants. So he if he had started, okay, well, whatever. But I played golf with this dude. I have never seen anybody hit a two iron like that in my life. He hit a two iron like three hundred and twenty five yards. I John I Daly. I right? couldn't believe it. Well, he he was crushed that golf athlete, ball. Man. He hit over four fifty in high school. Yeah, you know what the thing about him though? He never won a championship. He, you know, from little league, he came so close. Well, there's, there's many categories we could talk about. Well, he never won a championship. He, he was always bummed about that. And they were so close in that one World Series. And Dusty made that pitching change. And his, I swear, his, his teammate, didn't... his teammate, should be automatic first time ballot. In the Hall of Fame, Jeff Kent. No second baseman has hit 350 home runs and driven in that many runs. And as well, he's a little on the defense. Uh, bullshit. Jeff Kent should be automatic. There's so many guys. I could go down the list, man. It's unbelievable. There's a lot of guys. I, I forgot about I did a story on him. Blyde Bly Levin never made those. No, he's in now, finally. Well, he is. Yeah. It took 63 years to get him in. Yeah. <clears throat> You're exaggerating. That's not bit. factual. I'm not factual. <clears throat> I exaggerate sometimes. 63 years. To make my point. Did you hey, there's Al Branco. What's up, buddy? Coach Branco's here. You know, yeah. he called the first technical foul on me in my entire basketball career because I asked him why. No, he's just kidding. You know, old buddy. <laughs> old buddy, Coach Branco. <laughs> the great CRS coach. All right, we're going to cut this short. But uh, I got to get somebody, Branco on to somebody talk important. Some more. Somebody important. Yeah, here, somebody really. important here. Cut it out. Thanks, right. Michael Cost. Thanks. That was a that was a lot of fun. No, <laughs> all right. I just we're not that way, really. Michael, how are you? Good to Folks, see you, man. Thanks for listening. Uh, let's see it, Crawdaddies. Okay. What are you doing?